bacteria is everywhere. It's in the air, it's in the water. Trying to find the specific source can be tricky, but there's main points where bacteria tends to aggregate, and that's going to be in water holding tanks, RO filters, stock tanks, fertigation tanks, and then anywhere in your lines. So we're going to see contamination pretty frequently in filtration systems if there's not some sort of upstream sanitation going on. So that could be chlorine of some sort, calcium hypochlorite, uh, ozone, UV. But if somebody is not doing some upstream sanitation, then filters over time are going to tend to aggregate bacteria. And RO filters usually have particulate, carbon, and then the RO membranes themselves. And none of those actually sanitizes at all. So bacteria is going to tend to accumulate in especially carbon filters. If that happens, then anything downstream of that is going to be continuously reinfected with bacteria. It's all at the, the front end or upstream from your tanks. And I think a lot of people that are super focused about maybe sanitizing areas of their building, but not looking at how it's coming in, whether they're on an agricultural well, taking source water samples and determining what levels of bacteria there there are and when the last time the well was shocked. I mean, it's a common practice to shock an ag well if you're supplying it to a facility. So, you know, some people just don't even know that and don't know that that's an option to shock it so far upstream before it even comes into the building as your primary source of, of starting that sanitation process and then going through a series of filters or UV filtration, as well as pre-filtration, then into RO and then into your storage tanks. And then what are you doing with those tanks? Are you recirculating them and constantly moving the water? Is there a dissolved oxygen system running constantly and providing a, a DO level that can help with sanitation along with, you know, a recirculating UV loop? Or are you shocking those tanks with the level of chlorine or some type of water purification? Those are probably the most common, most effective ways to prevent your stock tank storage water. That then you're going to use that water to mix your concentrated fertilizer. You're going to use that water to then send through your injection skid. Or you're going to use that water to fill your batch tanks. Yeah, and the tricky part here is that it can seem like things are going fine for months and months. By the time facilities start off with brand new filters, tanks, water input, and they'll have no problems for a long time. And then all of a sudden, problems will start to happen. And they'll say, well, we didn't change anything. We've just been doing the same things we've always been doing. So it must have been something external that changed. But really, this is just, if you're not doing regular sanitation or some prevention with calcium hypochlorite, then this is a problem of cumulative exposure over time. And sometimes this can be at a non-pathological level for a long time before it actually becomes a problem. Once it becomes a problem, you basically you have to replace your filters, do a shock treatment, and you know it becomes a lot more work to solve. But if you can, running low levels of something like calcium hypochlorite can be really effective preventative or suppressive approach to this. It saves you a lot of uh, wasted cost and labor for cleaning later on. So starting early or shocking your system, like Egan was saying, and then following that up with a low level of chlorine is a pretty good strategy for preventing this from happening again. And what we like to do is take your starting water, say you have an RO or a source water tank, and dose calcium hypochlorite. So it's injected at a level that allows for seeing about two PPM of free chlorine at the dripper. And how much that might be in the tank could be much higher than you're actually seeing at the dripper. So if you want to see two PPM at the dripper and there's a high bacteria and fungi load in the system, it could be that you need six PPM or eight PPM of free chlorine upstream to achieve that that same target at the dripper. And so we call that like the residual demand for chlorine. It's like how much of it is being used up, how much of the ORP is being used up in the system through the fertigation components and your day tanks, batch tanks, and so on uh, before it reaches the dripper. So if that ship for prevention has already sailed and there's a problem, you're seeing significant buildup of biofilm. Maybe we've ran a water test and it comes back really hot for bacteria and fungi and you're getting some clogs or some some obvious biological buildup on your filters 
then what do you do? Um, at that point in time, one of your best options is use something like BioFlow. So a bioenzymatic cleaner that can, can feed it while your plants are in the middle of a cycle and it doesn't interact with them at all. But you can put it through your lines and it'll dissolve the biofilms. And that can be a really good way on the fly to fix a problem that's already gone too far for prevention to factor in. Yeah, I think there's also, you know, severe cases where you have facilities with a common header <clears throat> that can't ever get completely pulled offline and you can't turn the faucet off on on feeding the plants. So you can't really take the system down and do a real hard clean on it. I think when it comes to setting up the irrigation system, looking at where your lines are, where your main home runs are and strategically putting union valves and ball valves in where you can isolate portions of your system and if it's like you know chemicals at this point are not going to break things down as much as they need to because there's been so much neglect for years on the system and you know it's like an artery and it's finally just closing and it's down to like 10 percent flow and you're relying on the system to keep your garden alive i mean you need to break the line down either replace it which is expensive or be able to jet it somehow and at least get the main sections cleared out where then now the enzymatic cleaners and the flow of the water through that line have a little bit more ability to get some more aggressive flow rate through it and contact time with these with the enzymatic cleaner on a, a lower amount of bioflow where it actually could be a little bit more effective quickly i've seen some facilities that have had some crazy crazy neglect and crazy chemical reactions that have clogged lines to the point where you know you you have a one inch line that you can't even see through because it's just so built up and so clogged and maybe it's not the whole line but maybe it's at where the 90s are and where where it turns and where there's different pipe connection points that are kind of like giving it a rigid edge to grab onto and build up on um and it, it needs to be thought about more often than it is on where you're going to put these blowouts where you're going to put these ball valves because uh, if you don't have them you're turning your system off, cutting the lines to add those valves, creating a huge mess, you know, with, with <laughs> trash cans underneath you probably catching the water and, and the sludge that comes out of it. But at that point, you've now put in a, a few different layers of system maintenance that you can more easily do this on a quarterly basis, or even just be able being able to bust your lines open and quickly inspect what's going on in them. And if there is buildup present, so besides water is a contamination source, we also have air is another major vector. So air is coming in from outside facilities sometimes, or it's in facilities, and often they're got really warm, humid conditions. These facilities are using humidifiers. The air is going to have a lot of water in it. And this just gives a, a really good breeding ground for bacteria and fungi. So. HVAC systems can be come pretty heavily loaded, especially the filters. I recommend that people clean and replace their HVAC and dehumidifier filters on a regular basis because if these accumulate some bacteria or fungi, every time air is pulling through them, they're just reintroducing it to the room. Besides the HVAC systems, another place I've seen really nasty contamination from is humidifiers. So you'll see Depending on the facility, you can see a bunch of different types of humidifiers, but one way or another, most of them have some amount of standing water in them in a reservoir. And then this water is getting blown into small particles inside the unit, and then it's blasted out of the unit. But what this does, it just creates the perfect warm, humid breeding ground for things like fusarium and other types of nasty pathogens. So I've seen facilities where they weren't cleaning out and sanitizing their humidifiers properly. And because of this, they were just reintroducing pathogens to every single new harvest and having worse and worse problems along the way. So they figured out what was the main source of contamination here. It's too often overlooked that if it's out of sight, it's out of mind. If there's a dehumidifier way up in the air that isn't considered on, almost on a weekly basis of what level of contamination the pump 
the condensate water is collected in and then being pumped out of the room. A lot of those times they're not closed completely. More times than not, if you if you open them up, you can see this just insane sludge of mold and bacteria that's been growing in there for who knows how long, especially if you're in a facility with, you know, cocoa and you have little soil particles flying all over the air. You can't see them, but there's like a layer of, of dust, of cocoa dust on everything, on the top of your lights, on the top of your racks, on the top of your, if you have duct work in the room, it's on the top because it's, it's just resting up there and getting up to a point where people can't actually get up there and clean it. And then it's finding its way to, to a source of water, whether that's through a, a coil on a, on a mechanical system and being pulled through the return air side of it. You're flowering this crop for, you know, depending on the variety, call it eight to 10 weeks. And so every eight to 10 weeks, you have the opportunity to obviously change your filters, but then go through and inspect your system and clean your coils, clean out your condensate pumps. If you're having condensate collected to a central point off multiple systems, and then it's being pumped out and discharged out of the facility or to a central drain point. Every eight to 10 weeks, you have the opportunity to go through the maintenance and, and tear things apart, clean them, reset them, and give yourself that best opportunity to put your best foot forward when you load this beautiful veg round that you've worked so hard on from the start of your mother plants through a healthy propagation process into your veg stage and now into, into the flower room. For me personally, I think flower rooms are easier to break down and clean because you have that gap between rounds where veg, you're typically running a perpetual cycle and you always have plants in the room. You aren't able to kind of shut things down completely and break things down and do that hard sanitation process as often. So you're, you're kind of doing that more in zones and in sections um, as you unload it before you reload new, you know, new fresh clones into it. How do you recognize if you've got some problem with bacteria or fungi in your system? And it's really two parts. You're going to notice something's gone wrong, like your flow rates are reduced or something like that. And then you look and you see what's usually pretty obviously biological growth. So it could be slimy, brown or blackish debris growth inside a, on, on a filter or inside one of your lines or if you open up a flush valve and it comes out in contrast mineral precipitate is going to be usually chalky or crystally so usually pretty obvious when you see something that's stringy or slimy and black and brown and from there your next confirming step is going to be sending off a sample from different points in your system. So it could be a sample from the dripper, could be a sample from a filter housing in the fertigation system, or even your RO tank, and getting a total bacteria and fungi count. We can make assumptions as to where, what, what type of loads we have, but you have so many tools available to collect water samples, send to a lab to test for everything you want to test it for and really nail down how and where your problems are. Start at the front and work your way to the back, and then you're going to find out at what point you're creating the problem by either not looking at something as closely as you need to, not sanitizing as well as you need to, and not preventing just the problem to begin with, right? And down to air quality samples, there's plenty of monitors that you can deploy in your grow to measure the level of VOCs in the air that would then be potentially impacting open stock tanks, open concentrate tanks, areas that pathogens and fungi want to be and want to grow, the, the conducive host, right? They're gonna find their way to it. Leaky pipes, can't tell you how many times I've seen a dosatron manifold that's just been so neglected for so long and it's just cranking away, click, 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 click. But at every click, there's a drip somewhere at a union or where they haven't doped and, and taped the pipe thread together correctly. And then at the at the floor, because this dosatron's up against the wall, it meets the corner and there's a barrel in front of it or some sort of stand holding your nutrient tanks. And then underneath that is just <laughs> uh, a bomb, right? That's exploding all the time in, and putting things in the air and then just adding to the compounded effects of, of neglecting sanitation. And it may be in an area where Again, it's, you know, in your fertilizer room, your fertigation room, where you have these critical components that are now exposed 
to that and it's only being caused because of something that's being neglected. These issues are so common that we made a front row ag certified technician training and then specifically one module focuses just on how to recognize and address these issues. Well, and I think a lot of the times too, like, you know, the support that the reps give our clients and our, our, our entire team, you know, I say the reps because our, our sales team is out there every day talking to so many people. A lot of the time it's just high fives and success stories. And then a lot of the time it's fielding questions for what could be happening, what they could do better. And we like to have the understanding of just the cultural practices that are going on in the building. How well is this building set up? Is there a bunch of exposed drywall? Is there a bunch of exposed lumber and wood and things that can absorb water and then hold on to bacteria? Or do you have epoxied floors? Do you have rolled corners from your wall to your floor like a true GMP facility you know, should? Um, are you able to sanitize at the level you, you can? Um, and, and everything starts with understanding the details of every unique facility before really being able to put our best foot forward and advise on what potentially could be causing issues, having the understandings of all of those things that are ignored so often. Um, I guess I shouldn't say ignored so often. It is becoming more of an industry standard to be at a very high level of cleanliness and to really take care of the facility because they get beat so hard every day by hundreds of people, depending on the size of the, the operation, doors swinging open nonstop, some employees that maybe care more than others about the, the overall operation, their employer. But at the end of the day, they get beat up hard, right? So how well are we taking care of them? And how well are these facilities set up to actually maintain a level of cleanliness is, is something that I feel like our team does super well at understanding and then leading into the advisory portion of what to do next.